morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker for Sustainer Friday. General Stephen Whiting is the commander, U.S. Space Command, the 11th and newest Unified Combatant Command. General Whiting is responsible for defending U.S. and allied interests in the space domain while providing space-enabled combat effects to joint warfighters around the world. Within that responsibility, he leads over 18,000 soldiers, Marines, sailors, Coast Guardsmen, Airmen, and Guardians operating ground and space-based systems around the globe. Please welcome General Stephen Whiting for his keynote address. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today. It looks like you've had a great week to build connections and discuss the decisive advantage of logistics. Now, some of you may be wondering why the commander of the United States Space Command is here speaking to you today. Well, for that, we need to take a trip back in time. As many of you know, St. Louis is often referred to as the gateway to the West. It marked the United States Western frontier after being acquired from France as part of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Just one year later, the Lewis and Clark expedition set off from St. Louis charting the frontier from here to the West Coast and opening Western expansion for the United States. There are historical parallels between our nation's expansion and where we are today, opening space for expo exploration, commerce, and national security. And you can be assured, those parallels are built on the foundation of logistics and infrastructure, just as it was during the early 1800s. When St. Louis became part of the United States, it was the figurative edge of the continent, the starting point of westward expansion. Imagine Lewis and Clark setting off from these very shores all those years ago, embarking on a perilous journey to chart the uncharted to open new possibilities for the nation. Their success wasn't just about brave explorers, it was about the meticulous planning, the supplies they needed, the routes mapped, and the strategic placement of support systems. Now, fast forward to today. Our frontier begins at 100 kilometers above our heads and stretches to the very end of the universe. But we find ourselves in a similar position to that of Lewis and Clark. We are exploring the even more immense front frontiers of space this time. And just like the pioneers of yesteryear, we are charting new territories for exploration, commerce, and defense. And our modern journey requires more than just courage. It demands intricate logistics, sophisticated infrastructure, and seamless cooperation. Now, if you aren't already familiar with us, allow me to introduce you to United States Space Command, our nation's 11th combatant command. U.S. Space Command's goal is to ensure that space remains safe, secure, stable, and sustainable with the U.S. and our allies maintaining freedom, freedom of access, pardon me, freedom of access to and freedom of action in space. Today, U.S. Space Command is tirelessly tracking 44,700 objects on orbit. This staggering number reflects a remarkable 76% increase since our activation in August of 2019. Now, to accomplish this monumental task, we utilize a sophisticated array of ground-based radars and telescopes positioned strategically around the globe, along with cutting-edge space-based systems to create what we call space domain awareness. Among these thousands of orbiting objects, 9,400 are active satellites, and this number has been increasing at a geometric rate. These satellites are not mere points of light in the sky, they are engines driving our global economy, supporting America's way of life, and fortifying our national defense. Standing tall within U.S. Space Command are 18,000 joint military and civilian professionals, comprising our headquarters staff, our five service components, and one functional component command. Together, we shoulder a profound moral responsibility to the joint force, our nation, and our allies. Namely, we are tasked with the critical mission of providing space capabilities across all levels of conflict, a mission that has, been that has become increasingly vital since the Desert Storm era. And frankly, our joint force has come to rely on these space systems, shaping its operations and force structure under the assumption of uninterrupted access to these capabilities. 
This reliance underscores the urgency with which U.S. Space Command must protect and defend our space systems. Our aim is clear, to ensure our space systems remain available and operational no matter the situation and no matter the threat. Additionally, U.S. Space Command has a responsibility to protect the joint force from the increasingly sophisticated space-enabled militaries of our strategic competitors. Now, these competitors, the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation, now hold at risk U.S. and allied space capabilities because they know our joint force relies on space to fight the way we want, precisely, lethally, effectively, and efficiently. To put it plainly, the PRC's and Russia's actions have transformed space into a contested warfighting domain. The PRC's military operations have increasingly relied on space across all levels of warfare, enhancing the lethality and effectiveness of the People's Liberation Army's terrestrial forces through space capabilities. As of January 2024, the PRC's Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Satellite Fleet contained approximately 359 systems, more than tripling its on-orbit collection capability since 2018. With their space and counterspace systems, the PRC has dramatically increased their ability to monitor, track, and target U.S. and allied forces both terrestrially and on orbit. Similarly, Russia persists in developing, testing, and demonstrating their counterspace capabilities, despite the ongoing ground war in Ukraine where military reliance on space and space-enabled capabilities have been starkly revealed. Russia's actions in Ukraine have solidified the understanding that space is an indispensable enabler of terrestrial warfare. Despite these challenges, the United States stands today as the preeminent military space power in the world. Yet, we are acutely aware that our current space architecture is optimized for operations in a benign space environment. The reality now is that space is becoming an increasingly contested domain, and we must adapt if we wish to maintain our status. To meet this evolving challenge head on, U.S. Space Command must be equipped with improved capabilities and capacities, rigorously tested and staffed by right, highly trained personnel by the year 2027. While conflict in space is not a foregone conclusion, its potential consequences are grave. A conflict in this domain would be devastating, disrupting our use of space for potentially generations to come. The stakes are high, but the time for action is now. The work of U.S. Space Command is not merely a matter of protecting satellites. It's about safeguarding the very fabric of our national security, economy, and way of life. Together, we must stand ready, vigilant, and prepared for the challenges that lay ahead in the boundless frontier of space. U.S. Space Command faces a unique mission set as a combatant command, operating within and relying upon geographic and functional combatant commands while also overseeing assets in our own area of responsibility. Space operations, by their nature, traverse multiple domains, air, maritime, land, and cyber, creating inherently global and multi-domain challenges. The operational environment for conducting space operations and thus sustaining space op uh, capabilities spans these diverse realms. As a combatant command with a specific AOR, this makes U.S. Space Command an ING command, meaning we provide critical space effects to support others as they execute their missions. We recognize that our success is in inextricably linked to the success of our fellow combatant commands as we support them in achieving their objectives. Yet, we are also an ED command, meaning we rely on support from others when we are operating in our AOR. Thus, we deliver space effects for others, ensuring their operational success, while also fighting to maintain our capabilities against all threats. This calls for a comprehensive approach that not only addresses the immediate hurdles, but also prepares us for the complexities of modern space warfare. As we confront these new realities, it is imperative that we remain vigilant and proactive in safeguarding our interests and ensuring the security of our space assets. And to do that, we must understand the complex art and science of logistics in space. 
As the great general of the Army, Omar Bradley, once said, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics. This sentiment re resonates profoundly with the difficulties we face today in the space community. It truly takes everyone in this audience and the organizations you represent to make our future vision of space superiority a reality. Space is, by definition, a team sport with no single country, command, service, department or agency able to overcome single-handedly all the obstacles it presents. If logistics are hard on Earth, they are even harder on orbit, particularly when you consider that our satellites in low Earth orbit are moving at 17,000 miles per hour. These obstacles manifest in locations such as Betufik Space Base Greenland, previously known as Thule Air Base, positioned 750 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Serving as America's northernmost base and housing our sole deep water seaport in the Arctic Ocean, this site faces the daunting task of maintaining operations amidst two months of dark and, and of course, cold weather throughout the year. Meanwhile, down near the equator in the Pacific Ocean, Kwajalein Atoll represents its own significant challenges. The sensors at Reagan test site routinely grapple with tropical corrosion and logistical backlogs from weeks-long delays to essential supply deliveries. Most notably, most notably, though, the islands are still recovering from a recent rogue wave that caused substantial damage. As we continue to operate in these austere landscapes and others, we must emphasize the importance of creating both efficient and resilient sustainment processes. These processes maximize both logistical effectiveness and reliability in the face of natural barriers as well as resilience against cyber and other threats seeking to exploit our very long supply chains. These efficient and resilient sustainment processes will continue to be critical toward ensuring the uninter uninterrupted operations of our crucial space systems. This transformative period in space operations in which we find ourselves today warrants that we explore the possibilities of on-orbit sustainment. This shift is being driven by the realities of the contested and congested space environment we now find ourselves in, as well as humanity's expansion past Earth-facing orbits, venturing to the moon and beyond. As we navigate the expanding frontier of space, our current method of operations reveals significant limitations in our ability to effectively execute our mission. We need to rethink our approach and innovate to address these limitations. Take the concept of servicing satellites, for example. On-orbit servicing missions are not solely about extending the lifespan of satellites, although that is undoubtedly a valuable benefit. Instead, on-orbit servicing fundamentally transforms our ability to, to maneuver and operate within the space domain. As Lieutenant General John Shaw, the former Deputy Commander of U.S. Space Command, highlighted during last year's Space Symposium, the current limitations on maneuverability within the space domain con constrain U.S. Space Command's ability to move without regret, repair, and reconstitute assets. Historically, almost all of the Department of Defense's satellites since the dawn of the space age in 1957 were intended to remain in an energy-stable orbit to conserve fuel. However, the evolving landscape in space threats demands, that capability, demands the capability to move, maneuver, and respond dynamically. Without this ability to conduct what we call dynamic space operations, we would effectively be using the same tools that we did in the late 1950s to defend today's 21st century space domain. With the emergence of on-orbit threats and the need to move away from constant energy orbits, the call for industry to design space systems capable of sustained maneuverability within the domain is more pressing than ever. Through these innovative solutions and embracing the concept of on-orbit logistics, we can truly redefine how we navigate and operate in the vast expanses of space, ensuring our ability to achieve superiority in this critical operational domain. This shift in methodology will revolutionize our approach to space operations, enabling us to adapt and respond swiftly to changing circumstances. By implementing on-orbit logistics, we can extend the operational life of our satellites, 
intensify their usage, and enhance our overall resilience against adversarial actions. St streamlining our logistical processes isn't merely about efficiency. It's actually a critical necessity for the un uninterrupted function of our essential space missions. As we look to the future, this shift will be fundamental in ensuring our space capabilities remain robust, agile, and ready to meet the challenges ahead. Now, we've already witnessed successful commercial on-orbit servicing missions, with some currently underway, showcasing the potential to extend the operational lifespan of satellites that have depleted their onboard fuel. One notable example is the Mission Extension Vehicle Series. The first vehicle, MEV-1, achieved its maiden docking with the Intelsat IS-901 satellite on February 25th of 2020. MEV-1 is engineered to dock with geostationary satellites nearing the end of their fuel reserves. Once attached, MEV-1 utilizes its thrusters and fuel supply to prolong the supported satellite's operational life. By providing crucial propulsion and positioning capabilities, the satellite pardon me, essentially serves as a tugboat for the client's satellite allowing it to maintain an extended orbit and mission objective with precision. Following the mission of MEV-1, a second vehicle launched on August 15, 2020. This vehicle completed its docking with Intelsat IS-1002 on April 12, 2021, further demonstrating the invaluable role of on-orbit on servicing in enhancing satellite operations and longevity. These missions mark a significant milestone in space logistics and operations, showing how MEVs ensure satellites will be able to fulfill their missions effectively and efficiently. These advancements in on-orbit servicing open a myriad of possibilities for our satellite operations. We now have the capability to not only extend the operational life of satellites, but also enhance their functionality. Consider the potential for swapping out modular mission payloads to upgrade satellites or repurpose them once they are on orbit. This level of flexibility and adaptability marks a departure from past practices, but we've seen this kind of work already, such as the iconic case of NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. When launched with a flawed mirror, NASA conducted a series of intricate space shuttle flights and five spacewalks to repair it on orbit a monumental achievement that significantly contributed to our understanding of the universe. And later, NASA was able to upgrade the Hubble while it was well into its design life and while it was on orbit. However, as we look to the future, we recognize the need for more efficient and sustainable methods of satellite maintenance and enhancement. By embracing on-orbit servicing technologies and methodologies, we pave the way for a more resilient and effective satellite infrastructure, ensuring our space assets remain at the forefront of not only scientific discovery, but also national security. Central to this shift is the establishment of a robust on-orbit sustainment infrastructure. This infrastructure encompasses a range of capabilities from refueling vehicles and fuel depots, whether that be propellant or potentially solar charging, to enabling in-space assembly and modular hardware changeouts. Recently, I had the opportunity to visit Starbase in Boca Chica, Texas, where I witnessed SpaceX's Starship firsthand and engaged in discussions with senior SpaceX leadership. This visit comes at a crucial time as the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Space Force, and SpaceX collaborate on groundbreaking in initiatives like the Rocket Cargo Program. The AFRL Rocket Cargo Initiative aims to leverage SpaceX's Starship for rapid global cargo transportation. The success of SpaceX's recent Starship test launch, even while they're still perfecting the ability to get both the booster and the Starship back to Earth, underscores the potential of this new technology. The rocket cargo concept holds the promise to change how the U.S. military can deliver payloads in a fraction of the time we have become used to. This effort is about assessing a new approach to space operations, potentially transforming our space logistics and transportation. But to truly get to the future we desire, we also need modularized payloads, standardized interfaces, and in-domain logistics all of which paved the way for dynamic space operations. As we continue to refine these concepts and technologies, 
the vision of point-to-point -point rocket cargo delivering critical payloads worldwide in under an hour is becoming increasingly feasible, foreshadowing a new era in space mobility and security. However, this endeavor transcends individual organizations, demanding a vision of interoperability with allied partners and commercial industry. Standardizing refueling ports for satellites on orbit, for example, establishes a common framework for collaboration, maximizing the potential of our on-orbit sustainment infrastructure. As we embark on the creation of the first ever on-orbit infrastructure for space logistics, we call upon the expertise and diverse experiences of logistics professionals to ensure its success. This pioneering endeavor requires us to draw upon the collective wisdom and lessons learned from other domains to navigate the complexities of building and operating such a groundbreaking, groundbreaking logistical system in space. We stand at a critical moment where our decisions today will shape the future of space logistics. Each of you gathered here plays an essential role in delivering the capabilities that will secure space superiority for our nation. As Benjamin Franklin once said, for the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of a horse, the rider was lost. For the want of a rider, the battle was lost. For the want of a battle, the kingdom was lost, and all for the want of a horseshoe nail. This timeless wisdom reminds us of the profound impact even the smallest logistical oversight can have on our mission's success. In our pursuit of excellence and preparedness, we must attend to every detail, ensuring that no proverbial nail goes unattended in our space efforts. Each component of our logistical framework and every decision made in on-orbit sustainment contributes to the resilience and effectiveness of our operations in the vast expanse of space. The 2024 Logistics Officer Association Symposium provides us with a platform to explore critical topics, exchange ideas, and forge new partnerships. We need thought leaders like yourselves to help us navigate through the challenges that I've outlined this morning. As we delve into the complexities of space logistics, let me thank you for the vital role each of you plays in securing our nation's interests, both here on terra firma and in the space domain above. As we navigate these crucial times, let us remain vigilant, meticulous, and forward-thinking. Together, we will forge a path to a safer and more secure future in space. In closing, I look forward to a deeper partnership between the space and logistics communities. Thank you for your dedication, your service and your commitment to excellence, and for helping us to ensure there is never a day without space. Thank you for having me today, and I look forward to your questions. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are U.S. Space Command capabilities being integrated with other COCOMs and into O-Plan libraries, and what should logistics professionals be doing to help seamlessly link those capabilities? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, like all combatant commands, our primary duties are laid out in Title 10 of U.S. Code. In fact, it says very specifically, the primary duties of a combatant commander are, and three things follow, and I can assure you that uh, when federal law says what your primary duties are, I'm fascinated by what follows. And uh, the first thing it says is uh, the number one job of a combatant commander is to produce plans for the employment of the armed forces to support national defense strategies and military contingencies. So we are all about O plans. Uh, that, is, that is our bread and butter. Um, and the, the second of those uh, tasks are to uh, take actions as necessary to deter to deter conflict, so we have to be really good at uh, flexible uh, deterrence options, flexible response options, and then number three, to command the armed forces of the United States as directed, so we have to be good at command and control. So on the point of O-plans, uh, we have an approved O-plan, the first fully approved O-plan in the history of the space community. Uh, that O-plan is uh, interlinked with our, um, uh, with the other combatant commands and, and their O-plans, and we go through all the standard processes there that that involves, including the, you know, the TIB-FID flows and, and those kind of things. Now, ours is a little bit different. We don't have as intensive terrestrial uh, TIB-FID flows as uh, perhaps other O-plans, uh, but we certainly have them still. In fact, we're working with Transcom right now on a movement of a very important deployment into a part of the world we haven't been before, 
and so we work all those processes. Um, you know, for our logistics professionals, um, we ask them to do the same type of things they do at COCOMS to, to work all of that sustainment logistics for us, but I'll tell you one aspect that may be a little bit different. Um, our infrastructure, and by that I mean our buildings, our facilities, our, our fuel, our uh, um, HVAC, our electricity, that is primary mission capability for us because most of our um, assigned forces are deployed in place. And they're operating from places like Schriever Space Force Base or uh, places, uh, you know, uh, other bases around the world like Vandenberg uh, or where uh, our Army and Navy uh, forces uh, operate from. And so the condition of their uh, buildings, the, the redundancy of their electrical capability, their HVAC, uh, that is all business that our J4 team also has to be deeply involved in because um, just, just like um, the failure to get a unit to a deployed location overseas will keep them from doing their job, if our electrical or HVAC systems go down uh, at these critical operating locations where we conduct global operations from, that will, take us, uh, that will take us out of mission just like the failure to deploy a unit will. So I hope that got after the question. Thank you. Can you tell us what U.S. Space Command is doing to work on the field of space-based pre-positioned stocks? How far are we out from having this capability to incorporate into planning? Yeah, space-based pre-position stocks, I love it. Um, that will be a future that some of you will see. I don't think it will happen probably in my command tour, but I'll tell you what we could see in my command tour. Uh, I think we are on the cusp of having uh, refueling capability on orbit. In fact, I talked about some commercial versions of that. And if you're going to have a refueling capability in orbit, then having fuel depots on orbit makes sense. I think we may see that here in the next couple of years being led by commercial. And if we are able to get to that dynamic space operations future that I mentioned where we have uh, capabilities on orbit that can dynamically maneuver without having to worry about uh, the fact that they've launched with all the fuel they can ever expect to have, um, then I think we could see not only refueler, refueler satellites, but then fuel depots on orbit that would help those refuelers continue to, to you know, maintain their fuel levels and, and, and refuel other satellites. So I think that's where we'll start. Um, a very interesting, um, perhaps, Pathfinder for the military is what NASA is doing as they go back to the moon with Artemis. Uh, if you follow that, that's not just about getting humans back to the moon, although we're going to do that and that's going to be fantastic and exciting, but they're going to build a lunar gateway and that's all about the infrastructure that's needed to sustain a long-term human presence uh, on, on the moon and then perhaps we'll go beyond that. So I think that will also inform us about what other type of infrastructure is needed um, on orbit as we move forward. So thank you for that question. What is the strategic plan for industrial partnerships for the future of space and what are the primary challenges? Yeah, so I would say right now, U.S. commercial space industry is one of the United States principal advantages over our strategic competitors, period, dot. That is not just true for U.S. Space Command, it is true for us as a nation. I like to call this period that we find ourselves in the second golden age of space. Now the first golden age was, uh, was from the launch of Sputnik up through uh, Neil Armstrong walking out on the lunar surface. Uh, I was one and a half, so I don't remember that, but if you go back and read the histories and, and watch the, the, the documentaries, the, the world was energized by how exciting uh, that was. I think we are seeing equal excitement today, and it's being led by U.S. commercial industry. And in fact, the lead that U.S. commercial industry has over the rest of the world is actually widening right now. So what we want to ensure is that there remains a robust U.S. space defense industrial base, uh, whether those companies that have been in this business for decades or emerging companies, we want to make sure that all have a chance to compete and be successful. Um, and we want to continue to partner with them as much as possible because they are incredibly innovative and we have an opportunity to, to you know, catch those innovation curves. Their cost curves are very different than uh, we used to experience in space and that all accrues to our benefit. Um, so uh, our U.S. space defense industrial base is absolutely vital to us. You mentioned navigating orbital debris and preventing the PRC from creating more as a way of limiting our capabilities. What efforts are being done to manage this debris and is it possible to remove it? Yeah, so it's a great question on debris. It's something we certainly care about, and let me just demonstrate 
what we do because we care about this. So we have a unit, the uh, 18th Space Defense Squadron, a Space Force unit at Vandenberg, uh, and then another unit in Virginia called the 19th Space Defense Squadron. And between those two units, we essentially take all active satellites every day and we run them against, we do conjunction analysis against all the debris on orbit. And if we see that there's a potential conjunction between a Chinese, Russian uh, satellite, or even one of our satellites with a piece of debris, we actually send notifications off to China and Russia. And you may say, hey, Whiting, why are you telling them about these potential conjunctions? Well, because we care about safe operations in space, and we don't want one of their satellites to hit a piece of debris and create even more debris that we have to operate through. So we, we provide those warnings to the world. Now we're gonna transfer that responsibility over the next couple years to the Department of Commerce and they will do that for civilian, uh, commercial, academic organizations. We'll still continue to do it for military purposes but we'll focus on our military satellites. But the DOD, certainly US Space Command, we are not, um, we are not an organization that um, others have to come to to, to get licenses. We're not the organization responsible for cleaning up debris on orbit. And uh, you know, I know there are, there are organizations, there are companies out there looking at it. It is a very tough physics problem. If your solution, for example, to get a piece of debris on orbit is that you have to launch a satellite to go get that and grab it and then bring it down, that just doesn't scale. So we've got to continue to have uh, norms of behavior. We have those in the US government that we don't produce more debris. There are some of those norms of behavior at the international level as well, and we, 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 we don't want to keep producing more, but it's a tough challenge. It's a tough physics problem, and, um, and we, we need people to continue to be innovative to see if we can find ways to, to try to draw down the amount of debris that's on orbit. Can you talk about the key lessons learned from U.S. Space Command that they have gleaned from the Ukraine conflict? Has this made you drive changes to your logistics support posture? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, key lessons learned. I think we can, number one, say the importance of uh, cyber in defending the uh, space domain. I, I talk about cyber as the soft underbelly of uh, the space enterprise because our space networks are truly global, but they also extend out to 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface. And that means there's a lot of novel cyber attack surface. And, and so what's the link to Russia, Ukraine? You may recall on the opening day of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they did a cyber attack against a commercial SATCOM company, uh, taking, taking down tens of thousands of modems across Europe. Uh, it spilled far outside of Ukraine. And, um, and so we've got to protect ourselves in the cyber domain. Uh, I think we also can say the importance of commercial space, going back to that previous, um, that previous question. Uh, commercial space is now ubiquitous. And all of our operations, I think, have to assume that there will constantly be overhead satellites that are uh, able to, to watch our operations. So what does that mean for our, our logistics tails? What does that mean for our, our, our uh, lines of communications, our sustainment uh, locations? Uh, I think those are all very important questions as we move forward. Um, there's a lot of other lessons learned as well, but I guess just for brevity, those are the two I'd, I'd point to would be um, cyber and then uh, the importance of commercial space and the ubiquity of overhead imagery now. What steps are being taken to reduce classification of space programs to allow our allies and industry partners so that they have a better understanding and can integrate and support Space Command? Yeah, thanks for the question on uh, security classification. There's actually been a very important development. At the end of December, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Hicks, signed a new space security classification policy that, that updated a governing document from 2004 that now will appropriately classify our space capabilities. Um, and that will mean a lot will be at, at the rail level. Uh, much of it won't be unclassified, because just like we don't talk about systems in other domains, uh, but we're not going to just have to put the highest classification levels on it, and that is gonna really improve our ability to share that information, uh, not only across the joint force, because I need Indo-PACOM, I need, I need CENTCOM, I need UCOM, I need all of, the, all of the other combatant commands to understand our business so we can best integrate, but it will also, as the, as the uh, questioner asked, help us to integrate better with our international uh, partners. And uh, space is truly a team sport, and we have a number of very close international uh, partnerships, and, and the more we can share with them our capabilities, the better we can work together. So that's a really important step that the Department of Defense took at the policy level. It will take a year to implement, um, and, and so we're excited to help work that here over the next year because I think 
next year, if I get a chance to come back and speak to you, I think we'll be in a better place. What are some of the progresses being made in rocket logistics? I'm sorry, could you ask that one more time? What are some of the progresses being made in rocket logistics? Yeah, so I think it, it, it's the rocket cargo program, and I just was at Transcom yesterday, and General Van Obos was so gracious to host us and got to hear them talk about the point-to-point -point cargo. Um, I got to see uh, Starship on the pad at Boca Chica just a couple days before that third test launch uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, if, if they have a successful fourth test launch, then I think all of those thoughts of what rocket cargo and point-to-point -point could be are, are now available. We want to see other providers also providing that capability, and I know there's other partners in, in some of that work, um, and, and there are some upcoming launches which will demonstrate that capability. So I, I think once we have demonstrated that, that commercial, um, you know, commercial launch capability, it now starts to open up uh, those, those opportunities that AFRL and Transcom are looking at. And, and by the way, kudos to Air Force Research Lab and Transcom for being forward thinking thinking about these opportunities. Uh, I think they've been working this for a you know, number of years now, and, uh, and now we're starting to see that come to fruition. What initi initiatives will we have to protect our space assets, especially if we begin to put logistical support in orbit? Yeah, protecting and defending is, is why we have a U.S. Space Force and it's why we have a, a U.S. Space Command. You know, prior to 2019, most of our space capability was in the U.S. Air Force, and I was a longtime airman, loved the U.S. Air Force. Air Force built the world's best space capability, but in 2019, the nation kind of looked at itself, looked at the threats, and said, we are not optimally organized for um, a world in which the threats are what they are now, what, what Russia and China have publicly demonstrated through their ASAT tests, through um, you know, on-orbit uh, demonstrations that they clearly have done uh, so that we can see, and they're sending us a message. And so in August of 2019, we stood up U.S. Space Command, and in December of 2019, stood up the U.S. Space Force. Because, because the actions of China and Russia have, have made space a warfighting domain. So now, you know, you have to have all the kind of capabilities you have in every domain. You have to have command and control, intelligence, cyber, offense, defense. You gotta be able to integrate that. You gotta be able to leverage joint fires. And so all of that work is what's ongoing uh, right now uh, to make sure that, that we can protect and defend our capabilities and ensure that we have access to and, and uh, the ability to maneuver in space in a, in a way that is free so we can execute the, the things we need to on behalf of the nation. So uh, you know, that work is ongoing and, uh, and, and look forward to talking about that more in the future. Okay, sir, final question. Will the future of furthering logistics in, in orbit drive an expansion of careers in the United States Space Force? So, you know, I, I'm a Space Force officer. I am, uh, I am a joint um, commander, though, so I can't speak for the U.S. Space Force. I will only say I think um, the Space Force, as we move forward, uh, will have to continually assess whether the five career fields that they currently have, and, and I'll go through those, uh, op the first three are both officer and enlisted, uh, operations, space operations, intelligence and cyber, and then the final two are officer only, uh, acquisition and development engineer. I think the Space Force will have to continually assess based on uh, the current environment, the plans moving forward, uh, whether those are the uh, only career fields that are needed in the uniform side. Of course, we get access to outstanding um, civilian guardians who do a number of other things for us, including logistics. Um, so I, I can't uh, tell you yes or no, but I do believe that needs to be a constant assessment. Of course, we have to do that in partnership with our Air Force teammates, um, the Space Force and the Air Force, both being a part of the DAF and this relationship that's been built that the Air Force provides uh, just an incredible amount of support, running those bases, uh, giving us the logistics capability largely that we need uh, on those bases. Um, just have to continually assess that in partnership with the Air Force to decide what does the Space Force need indigenously as we move into this future and, and what can continue to be provided either through our civilian corps uh, or through the Air Force. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the conference.